Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Scott Pickering, General Manager of East Bay Media Group. Um, I am here tonight to host a forum organized by the Newport County Chapter of the League of Women Voters. Uh, this is similar to a forum that was hosted a week ago, uh, featuring a different panel of Newport, Newport County legislators. You can view that forum uh, online with the Newport This Week website and on social media and on the eastbayri.com website as well. Uh, our purpose tonight is to give you a very informal update on some of the issues that are facing legislators today as the 2022 General Assembly session is underway and issues that are affecting residents as well. We have with us tonight five legislators from Newport County. We have Senator Wally Felag, District 10, representing Warren, Bristol, and Tiverton. We have Senator Jim Seveny, District 11, representing Portsmouth, Bristol, and Tiverton. We have Representative Terry Courtfriend, representing District 62, Middletown, and Portsmouth. We have Representative Susan Donovan, District 69, representing Bristol and Portsmouth. And we have Representative Michelle McGaw, District 71, representing Portsmouth, Tiverton, and Little Compton. Tonight's forum is a collaboration between the Newport County League of Women Voters and the East Bay Media Group in Newport this week. At this time, I'd like to introduce Jill Cassis, president of the Newport County chapter of the League of Women Voters. Thanks, Scott, and welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Newport County, I, wanna, Scott, I certainly wanna thank you for moderating and recording this legislative update that will complete the participation of all of the legislators in uh, Newport County. Thank you also to Jean Quinn and George Cassis for timing. And most of all, thanks to the legislators who are participating tonight. Regrettably, Senator De Palma and Senator Uhr cannot be with us. They have sent their apologize, uh, apologies for missing tonight's forum due to a sudden scheduling conflict with the Senate Rules, Government, Ethics and Oversight Committee on the recently reported RIPTA cyber data breach. So we look forward to hearing from the legislators here tonight on what their priorities are. The League is working hard in Newport County and all of Rhode Island to support voter rights, particularly the let RI voter bills seeking to extend permanently the relaxed voting practices that followed in 2020, which we believe resulted in much higher voter turnout and which have now expired. And with that, um, I'll, turn it, I'll turn the forum over to Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Jill. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly go over the format for tonight's uh, program. Each of the five legislators is gonna have an opening statement of up to 90 seconds if they choose. You're always welcome to, to use less time, that's fine. We're then gonna go through a series of six questions, all of which were shared with the legislators ahead of time. And we're going to alternate who goes first in each one of those. We have with us on the panel that you can see, we have two timers who are going to be tracking how long you're talking for. They're going to hold up a yellow sign when there's 15 seconds left. There, there you go. And they're going to hold up a red sign when it's time to stop. And if you don't notice it or you keep talking, I'll give you a little bit of a nudge. And if you keep stop talking, I'll probably mute you so we can keep the uh, time equal for, for everyone who's participating. At the end, we'll have a closing statement. We'll go in reverse order and, um, and that's it. So I'm gonna get us started. Um, remember when I, uh, I, I'll direct everyone through, I'll call on you when it's your turn to, uh, to take the floor. And I would just remind you to remember to unmute yourself when the time comes. Susan Donovan, we'll turn to you for our first opening statement. Welcome. Don't forget to He's unmute. There. Hi, I just unmuted. Thank there you. you All right. Well, thank you to the League of Women Voters and to Scott from the East Bay Media Company for making this forum possible. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here. So I'm Susan Donovan, representing part of Bristol and Portsmouth, including Prudence Island. And it's, I'm in my third term, which going on six years in the House of Representatives. I sit on the House Committees in Education, Veterans Affairs and Oversight, 
and I'm the vice chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm also chair of the Aging and Senior Services Committee, which is a subcommittee of oversight. Um, so I'm also a member of two committees that are part of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. They are the Rhode Island Interagency Agency Coordinating Council for Early Intervention and the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council. So that is my um, participation in um, the General Assembly at this moment. So I guess I can move on to the first question. Yeah, we're going to go through. Uh, everyone's going to have their okay. opening remarks first, so you all can right. you can sit tight. Uh, all right. Next up is Michelle McGaw. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Again, I like like uh, Representative Donovan. I, I really want to thank the League of Women Voters for for bringing us together uh, to speak to the people in Newport County about a lot of the important work that we're doing as their elected representatives. I represent Portsmouth, Tiverton, Little Compton, and. Um, in that this is my first term and I'm serving on the state government and elections committee and on the veterans affairs committee. And I was honored to be included as part of the house COVID vaccine task force, which was put together last year, um, just as the vaccine was rolling out to make sure that everyone had access to vaccine. And I just wanna say, I feel really fortunate to have been elected among this group of esteemed colleagues and to work side by side with them in, in such a collaborative way. We all talk so frequently and we work really well together. And, and I feel like that collective approach has just provided us with so, so many great opportunities to create and advocate for solutions to some of the challenges that our communities are facing. Uh, each one of us bring our particular strengths to the table and the diversity in those strengths makes us a really productive team. Whether it's helping to support our local community and mental health providers, working towards environmental and climate solutions, tackling broadband concerns, or the many other discussions that, that are ongoing. Uh, the collaboration of this group, it just gives me a lot of hope for, for what is possible. And um, so uh, I'm really pleased to be here and to work with this group. And um, thanks again for having me. Thank you. Uh, Wally, Senator Felag. <laughs> Thank you, Scott, and uh, Jill and League of uh, Women Voters uh, Newport for sponsoring in this forum. Uh, as Scott mentioned, I am the state senator representing probably 100% of the town of Warren, maybe 38% of the town of Bristol, and 55% of the town of Dividend. I am currently the vice chairman of the uh, Senate Finance Committee and the chairperson of the Senate Special Legislation and uh, Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, this fall winter has been very busy for myself uh, because of the fact that those particular committees that I've been uh, asked to serve on met frequently through the fall and the winter. I was on the uh, Senate Finance Subcommittee and we had probably around 16, 17 meetings on the opera funds that were distributed and the governor has now uh, put his uh, signature on that $1.13 billion uh, in nine different categories from housing to economic development, to workforce development, to public health, small businesses. And we'll be going through that particular uh, thing soon. The other item that I was on was on the uh, redistricting committee that happens once every 10 years, we had 17 meetings and my goal as the only representative from Newport and Bristol County was to ensure that we had the proper representation and we have done that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Representative Cortfriend. Good evening uh, and thank you to the organizers um, for hosting this. As uh, my colleagues have all said, we really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to the people of Newport County. Um, I wanted to make one little correction. I'm District 72, not 62, um, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, I serve in the House. This is my second term. Um, I'm Terry Courtfriend. I represent the southern half of Portsmouth and the east side of Middletown. And I am serving on the Environment Committee, the Internet and Innovation Committee, the Oversight Committee, and I'm sec second vice chair of the Small Business Committee. And this uh, summer, I've been uh, extra busy with uh, chairing 
the Commission on Shoreline Access, which has become, I've become very knowledgeable on that topic. And uh, I was glad to see one question kind of touches on that work. Um, so I look forward to answering that question later in the program. And thanks again for having me. And uh, I do um, have esteemed colleagues. I echo what uh, Rep McGaw said, we all do work very closely together and the people of Newport County should know that especially in the house. Uh, I'll let the senators speak for themselves on that, but in the house, we're very collaborative. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the district. I wrote it down correctly. Okay. I just read it incorrectly, which I mean, I'm a writer, so I, I write way better than I speak. So it's not a problem. I, I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. All right, last Senator 70. Hi, uh, <clears throat> well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Scott and uh, Jill for putting this on. I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to serve uh, uh, Senate District 11. That comprises uh, all of Portsmouth, the, uh, the Southern 30% uh, or so of Bristol. And I have a, a, a strip right through the center of, uh, of Tiverton as well, south of Wally's district and just north of uh, Lou de Palmas. Um, <clears throat> It's great to be a part of this. I'm glad uh, that you put on forums like this. Uh, I mean, every opportunity that we have to uh, to speak our piece about the issues uh, and get it out there to as many voters as we can, I think it's important. And uh, and for that reason, I'll, I'll thank you again and say I'm uh, very pleased to be here. I serve on uh, Senate Finance, Senate Education. I serve with Wally on uh, special legislation and veterans. And I'm also the vice chair of uh, of uh, Senate uh, ethics and oversight, which I'm playing hooky from right now. I, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move into our questions. Uh, Representative, Representative Donovan, we're gonna come back to you to start. Okay. I'll, I'll read it first so the audience knows. The first question, what changes could you suggest to the Rhode Island legislature's rules that would allow community, I'm sorry, that would allow committees more control over which bills get floor votes? Currently, many good bills and legislative initiatives that deserve discussion and votes in the full bodies never reach the floor. Well, thanks for that question. Uh, well, it's true that in the past, it was very difficult to move a bill from committee to the floor without the approval of the speaker and leadership. But my experience last year was quite different. In the 2021 session, we experienced some robust floor debates with members of the same party disagreeing on proposed legislation. I, I think it's instructive to hear colleagues defend their positions for or against a bill. So that being said, I would support a change in the rules that would make for more legislation coming to the floor, but only legislation that had a majority vote of that particular committee. You have to remember that we are part of, we are part-time legislature and it would be impossible to bring all the bills to the floor that we hear in committee. So yes, I would be, um, I would be um, supportive of changing the house rules to make that easier. Thank you. Representative McGaw, same question. Great. Um, uh, this this being my 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 freshman uh, round in in the house, I I can't say what it was like prior to my being there. Although I can say that I was certainly spent enough time there, uh, in in the committee hearing rooms and watching the floor debate to know that it was challenging to get bills to to come to the floor in the past. And um, I think in the last year, since since we have have had a change in speaker and we were able to update some of the rules in the last year, I think it's made a, a real big impact because I'm not seeing the hurdles that we had seen uh, previously. And so I was really happy to see um, as much conversation going on around the bills um, as you know this year. I, I just feel like like there was a lot more debate and discussion and, and I thought I was really encouraged by that. I do think that there are some things that maybe we can make uh, some improvement on. Uh, one of the things I would like to see the, the 
change a little bit would be for committee members to have some say in who the chair of a committee would be. Uh, right now, that's all decided from the Speaker of the House. And I would love to see some changes in that so that there was more of a democratic process in regards to the makeup of those committees and, and who's going to chair it. Uh, and like Representative Donovan, I, I think it would be great to see bills that really have the support of the body come to the floor for a vote um, regardless. I think bringing those debates forward is really important, whether or not it has the majority of the committee or if it's a bill that was able to garner more than 38 signatures uh, on, on that piece of legislation to, to be able to bring that forward, I think would be really valuable. And so certainly I would support any initiatives in rules changes to, to ensure that, that those bills were brought forward. Thank you. Senator Feeling. Well, I think uh, the first thing that people have to keep in mind is that we usually have 2,400 bills a year, around 1,300 in the Senate, around uh, in the House rather, and about 1,100 in the uh, Senate. And that any of those bills that have fiscal implications cannot be just arbitrarily voted on, on the floor because uh, it would destroy the budget. So we have to ensure that that doesn't happen. But our committees have control over the legislation. Uh, the committee spends countless hours uh, reviewing legislation and corresponding with witness positions uh, before deciding the next step. Uh, keep in mind that many bills, uh, especially a new bill, uh, requires extensive review. We have to ensure that there's proper from a legal perspective before we can bring it to the floor. Uh, we allow people to comment on the bill later on and there's modifications. So it's the committee's job to make sure that we do a complete full analysis of the bill and vet them properly before we bring them to the floor. Thank you. Representative Portman. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Senator Felag is talking about. An idea that I've been thinking about that I would like to put forward in the 2023 session. I don't think we'll change rules midstream, but should I be fortunate enough to be reelected and and am in the House in 2023? I, I plan to put forward a rule change that would. Um, have committees, um, have the committee, the specialty committees vet um, proposed legislation to the finance committee because what Senator Felag said is absolutely right. Um, we can't uh, just be passing bills without consideration for the public, for the, um, the financial implications. But what happens now is bills often get forwarded to finance particularly around the environment, which is a, an area that, since I sit on an environment committee that I've really noticed this in, and we're sending the bills to a committee that may not have the same expertise. So I would like to see the bills be pre-vetted by the committee that's involved with that particular topic and then go to the finance committee. I don't know if this would make things uh, faster or bog the process down, but I think uh, we would get maybe a better outcome and we, and we would be able to build more consensus around uh, important legislation. So, thank you. Thank you. Senator Sevigny. Uh, thanks. So, uh, I mean, Wally laid it out, I thought, pretty comprehensively on how the committees have to work and some of the practical realities with uh, what can and can't be done with all the legislation that comes through. Um, my own, my own belief, and I, I've raised this a couple of times uh, uh, when we're uh, um, deliberating over the rules, you know, and, and the rules stick for, for an entire session, a two-year period. So uh, as, as Terry was pointing out, this uh, uh, rules changes come when, after each election, when a new, uh, when a new Senate and new House is, uh, is uh, sworn in. Um, but in, in, in my view, uh, out of respect for the leadership, um, I do believe that the Senate president uh, should be able to choose his leadership team. And that leadership team actually is the committee chairs. Uh, once that's done, it's my view that, uh, you know, the, the, the chairs 
no longer serve at the at the uh, at the pleasure of the president. They they serve for the term for both sessions, and uh, and they are really not answerable uh, directly to leadership. Um, my belief is that that would free up the chairs uh, to uh, have a free hand in what they do with legislation and the, and the, and the committee members they, uh, they work with. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next question, uh, Representative McGaw, we're gonna to turn to you first for this one. Uh, but the question is, what specific steps to control greenhouse gases can realistically be passed in the upcoming session? Would you sponsor such legislation? I am really, was very happy to see this question. Uh, last year, passing the act on climate was, was really such a significant uh, moment for, for Rhode Island. And it's up to all of us really to be working towards making sure that we're meeting the mandates of that piece of legislation. Uh, that being said, it, um, understanding where the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from uh, is certainly uh, first and foremost in when we're deciding how we're going to tackle those. And for me, looking at the fact that transportation accounts for more than a third of our greenhouse gas emissions, that really uh, puts transportation at the head of the line of the types of things that I want to address and really piggybacks on, on something that I had started talking about last year when I introduced legislation to try to improve access to uh, EV charging infrastructure and started introduced a bill last year really to start it as a discussion, get, get the discussion moving. And uh, really, I'm, I'm very excited to see how much that conversation has really just taken off in the past six months, uh, both on a state level and federally with, you know, this uh, current administration talking so much about EV infrastructure. Uh, Rhode Island is, in, exact, in, in fact, is getting $23 million earmarked specifically for EV infrastructure. And so that's something I'm really working on is helping to shift our transportation sector, whether it's public transit or alternative transportation like biking or transitioning to electric vehicles. Thank you. Uh, next question, or same question, I'm sorry, to Senator Felix. Yes, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, yes, I would sponsor this type of legislation. Uh, as a senator who represents coastal communities in the ocean state, uh, I've always supported and advocated for the protection of the environment and working towards curbing our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we were fortunate last year, the Senate and the House, to have excellent sponsors. Uh, Senator Oyer sponsored the Act on Climate from the Senate perspective. I was a <clears throat> co-sponsor of that legislation and uh, I'd love to see it move forward with the goals that it was established in that legislation. And this year, uh, Senate President Ruggiero is uh, reintroducing his renewable energy standard bill that uh, transitions the state to 100% of renewable energy by 2030. I support this alleg legislation and believe it uh, has a realistic chance of passing. Uh, as we approach greenhouse gases from multiple uh, angles, we must remember that uh, it's, not only, it's not only limited to public transportation, uh, renewable energy, technology, uh, building standards, electric vehicles, infrastructure, and uh, community uh, resiliency. So uh, these are a number of aspects that uh, we hope that the Senate will address in this session. So thank you. Right on the dot with the red Perfect. line. Well done. Uh, next, Representative Courtbrand. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, yes, I would support um, in, or introduce legislation. I was the um, House sponsor of the TCI bill, the Transportation Climate Initiative, which uh, involved the three uh, states, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, and Washington, D.C. And so I was very disappointed to see uh, Governor Lamont in Connecticut and then um, uh, Governor Baker withdraw their support and kind of left uh, Rhode Island at the altar, so to speak. And uh, so 
Um, that's not going to be introduced this year because it was really a regional approach. I hope it comes back, but um, I think people were uh, concerned about uh, rising gas prices. And even though this is not a gas tax, absolutely not a gas tax. So um, that being said, that's shelved for the moment. And uh, But I was meeting with um, advocates this morning about uh, maybe taking some elements of TCI that we could move forward just to signal to our neighboring states that uh, Rhode Island is ready to move forward with this. And um, also have a bill that I'm working on for the heating sector. Um, I have not put, introduced it formally, but am floating it around to advocates and the agencies. And this bill would move to, uh, it would give us a path uh, to uh, get us off of uh, natural gas uh, and it's modeled off of Massachusetts legislation. And so I will end it there since I see the red card, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Seveny, your your uh, Thanks. Uh, yeah, right now, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll sponsor any responsible, uh, uh, you know, climate initiative um, legislation. I'm working right now with the uh, Department of Administration. Uh, they manage the state's vehicle fleet, which is quite substantial. And uh, we're putting together a bill uh, to uh, set up successive targets over the next 10 years to replace the state's vehicle fleet up to 50% uh, with uh, zero emission vehicles. Some of the constraints there are some of the heavy duty vehicles, uh, ambulances, uh, trucks, et cetera, are really not appropriate for, uh, for electric vehicles, at least not at this stage in the technology, but, uh, um, but certainly for future thinking. Um, so that bill will be introduced uh, this term has been introduced in the past, and uh, uh, we've been working quite closely with the uh, with the vehicle managers to make sure that uh, it's reasonable and it's something that can be successfully achieved. Um, I was a co-sponsor on a TCI bill uh, this past uh, this past year. I'm a firm believer in uh, in uh, you know being responsible for cleaning up the messes you make, and uh, and that's how I felt the TCI initiative was. If, uh, if we're going to choose to use gasoline, we should also be a part of whatever the plan is to clean up after ourselves. So with that said, uh, that's what I'm doing. Thanks. Representative Donovan. Okay. All right. So I think we should continue to support the renewable energy programs already in the works and keep, keep meeting the mandates in our landlock landmark act on climate legislation. Um, we should use our infrastructure monies from the federal government to make improvements in the transportation sector with access to better roads, bike paths, high speed rail, um, bus transit. This would, go, this would go a long way in reducing emissions. But my issue is we must begin to recognize the connection between food loss and food waste as it relates to CO2 emissions. Food production accounts for one third of all global greenhouse gas emissions in the US. 40% um, of the food produced is wasted in the US. So food that ends up in the landfill generates methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Re reducing food loss everywhere should be the next step in making any significant impact on greenhouse gas. So I would sponsor and or support any legislation that addresses this issue, even in a small way. Unfortunately, um, a couple of years ago, legislation removing the liability in donating food did not pass. So as of now, there really isn't any infrastructure in place for donating food or any infrastructure in place to compost food waste in Rhode Island on a large scale. I know Representative Carson has done a lot of research in this area, and I'm hoping we can put our heads together um, with other like-minded legislators in the East Bay um, to start working on, you know, on food <laughs> waste and food loss. There's a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we're going to move to another question. Uh, Senator Freelag, you're going to be the first one to go. I'll read the question first. Will you support 
enshrining the steps to make voting easier, which were employed during the last election, making them permanent. This would include excuse free, sorry, excuse free mail ballots and dropping the notary or two signature requirements and early days for voting with some weekend hours. Uh, yes, uh, I, I believe the last election went very well in terms of providing an opportunity uh, to vote. If you didn't vote in the last election, uh, I don't know what other means we could have done to make it uh, easier and accessible for you. I remember back in the day when uh, we were doing a bingo system and I asked the person, I said, uh, you haven't voted yet. Can you come and vote? And he says, Wally, I can't. My wife's working and I'm home with my four little kids. So I said, well, how about if I come over to the house and babysit your four little kids, will you vote? He goes, yes, I will. And so I went over to the person's house. So, you know, those are the types of things that working families, older people uh, have encountered uh, on election day. Uh, it may be snowing, it may be inclement weather. And all, those are all excuses that people have not to vote. And so uh, if we can make it easier, like we did in the last uh, election for people to have that opportunity to vote, then I say, uh, let's go with it. I've co-sponsored that type of legislation. Uh, we're going to take a holistic approach on that and ensuring that the uh, proper measures are in place to ensure that everybody exercises their right to vote. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Cortfriend, same question about election laws. Yes, I would support any and all the above to make uh, voting easier. Um, I was sorry that it didn't come to the, sh to the floor last year. I, I actually marked it down as one of my priority bills, even though I wasn't the sponsor of it, because I think it's that important when we look around at what's happening across the country. Um, I, I want Ro to be proud about Rhode Island's uh, voting requirements and not feel like we are one of the states that makes it more difficult. We should be making it more, more easy for our constituents to get to the polls. And I thought the three ways to vote in the last election worked out really good. And I would definitely be a supporter and I have signed on to that bill. So I hope to see it come to the floor sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sevney. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, I strongly support uh, all of the initiatives that, uh, that were employed last election cycle, uh, all, the, uh, all the ideas that uh, Secretary Gorbea has for uh, expanding the, uh, uh, the accessibility uh, to vote. I mean, it, we're watching all this unfold on national TV. Uh, um, we must make it as easy as possible for uh, for folks to vote. I uh, I support um, automatic registration for voting through whatever process, whether it's DMV records or or whatever. But if you're if you're an adult, if you're of legal majority in the state of Rhode Island, uh, you need to be registered to vote. Um, so I support all of the, uh, all the current initiatives and I'm eager to, uh, uh, to see them get to the Senate floor. So I can vote yes on all of that stuff. It's critical to us. It's one of the reasons you all exist, right? Jill, that's what we're here for. So I'm a supporter. Thank you. Representative Donovan. Okay. So yes, I support, um, that bill wholeheartedly. Uh, the problem in our country isn't too many people voting, it's too few. So we should be making it easier for people to vote, not harder. Uh, like um, the other Senator said, uh, the housebound, elderly, disabled, those working multiple jobs or those caring for children and family members, they all face impediments to voting in person. And according to Secretary of State, Gorbea, the last election was the safest and securest yet, despite having a record turnout. And according to the secretary, voter fraud was not an issue. So yes, I support making the changes permanent. Thanks. Thank you. And Representative McGaugh. Uh, like my colleagues, I, I'm also in support of this. I've actually signed on uh, to the, the Let Rhode Island Vote Act which basically just takes what we did in the last election and makes it um, 
permanent for so that it's easier for people to vote. I can say when I was out um, in the last election talking with people, I actually knocked on doors to people who said they hadn't voted in maybe 15 or 20 years. And, you know, it was people who were disabled and had trouble getting out to the polls to vote or if they had a mail-in signature, they would have to kind of go out and try to find a notary to get a signature on it. So by removing those hurdles, we were able to bring people into the voting electorate that, that really had not been able to participate in a long time. And so uh, when this came up for discussion about making those changes permanent, I was all in on that. I'm really excited to make it more easy, you know, more accessible to everybody. It's, it's a big, it's a big, uh, need and with everything we're seeing across the country, I'm thrilled that we're talking about uh, here in Rhode Island making it easier for people to vote as opposed to putting hurdles between that. Um, for anybody that's not familiar with those changes, it would take away those notarized signatures for mail ballots. Uh, it would take it would allow people to apply for a mail ballot online. Uh, it would um, allow access to no excuse early voting, which made it so easy to go to town hall and vote in the last time and 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 leaves those drop boxes outside of our town hall so we can drop off those mail ballots. So I think those are all really important for us to continue forward. Thank you. OK, we're going to we're actually halfway through our forum, just in case anyone's wondering. Uh, we're going to move to our next question. The first person to respond will be Representative Courtfriend, uh, but here I will read the question first. Would you support loosening Coastal Resources Management Commission regulations to enable homeowners to protect their property from rising sea levels? Would you support financial assistance to do so? Um, I do not want to see uh, CRMC's um, authority or regulatory um, abilities uh, diminished. I think it's, in fact, I would like to see them increased. Um, uh, CRMC has been working, they have a seat on my study commission for shoreline access, and uh, it's become clear that they are probably understaffed and don't have the enforcement abilities that they should have. Um, and don't have the, the legal uh, resources that they need to continue developing more right of ways. But in terms of resiliency, what one house does can affect what happens to the neighbors. So one person puts out uh, some kind of hard um, infrastructure and that totally changes what happens to their neighbors' properties. And so I think this all has to be well thought out. In terms of funding, I am in favor of the state assisting communities, but not just one homeowner. It's got to be a community developed plan. And I applaud what's happening in Warren and in Barrington now, uh, where communities, the towns are actually talking about retreat as opposed to just because at some point you can't hold the water back anymore. So I think we need to have a broader look at this problem through a broader lens and um, tackle it not piece property by property, but more holistically. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sevigny. I'll start just by saying I agree with much of what, uh, what Terry had to say about this. I believe it is a community uh, problem and a community approach is needed. I do believe that, uh, that you know, resources from the state should be brought to bear. Um, it's going to be a, a holistic approach. It's not just a particular property owner or a community of property owners. It's also the public infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's great to, to be able to save some number of, uh, of homes uh, from encroachment, you know, from sea level rise or whatever, but the public infrastructure, the roads, uh, <laughs> telephone poles, uh, you name it, all, that all has to be a part of the, the, the package, and that is a large, expensive undertaking uh, that needs to be well thought out, planned uh, years in advance of action. Um, in terms of the CRMC and their powers and duties, uh, the shoreline is a precious uh, resource uh, of our state, and uh, it needs to be protected. And it needs to be protect, protected in a comprehensive and fair way. 
Uh, as Terry pointed out, you know, you can't have neighbors going off and doing their own thing because it, it's, uh, it's not just themselves that they affect. So there has to be some oversight. There has to be, uh, I think, better leadership uh, and more staff. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Representative Donovan. Okay. So right now there's a house commission studying the effects and procedures for reorganizing the CRNC. So I wouldn't propose anything until we hear from that commission. But I will say this, what's the point of plugging a hole in a seawall or, bil or building one when your next door neighbor doesn't even have a seawall? That's not how we deal with coastal, coastal flooding or sea level rise. So dealing with coastal flooding and erosion, it, it just isn't done house by house. It's much larger than that. So we need an expertly drafted mitigation plan executed by the proper agency before people start altering their properties. And before we can even think about financial assistance to those homeowners or those programs, we need to establish a dedicated revenue stream to fund those programs. We don't have anything like that right now. So the answer would be no. Um, I wouldn't loosen any regulations until we know much more about where the CRMC is headed and have the financial assistance measures in place. Thank you. Representative McGaugh. Thank you. Um, I have to, I, I agree with my colleagues. I, I think this has to be done much more on a community level or, um, or lar larger than our individual communities. Uh, every property, every action that we take along our coastline is going to impact people, uh, not just next door to us, but across the bay. And so we want to make sure that whatever we, whatever methods we take to tackle these resiliency and these shoreline issues, that we're doing it in the most responsible way. And I recognize that uh, in our community, there's a lot of, there's some skepticism around CRMC. And I'm really happy to see this commission doing so much work. Uh, to review what the CR, how the CRMC works, how it can be improved. And um, I think it's important that we include them in the conversation, uh, but that we provide them with the resources uh, necessary so that they have the expertise to tackle some of these challenges that are, are coming before us. Uh, these challenges aren't going away. And um, so I think it's really important that we have something, you know, so, uh, uh, an agency on board that's gonna provide some oversight uh, to make sure that what we are doing is gonna be the most effective solution, uh, not just for individual homeowners, but for, for everyone. Thank you, and Senator Felix. Thank you very much. Uh, a recent uh, Providence Journal report examined uh, my community of Warren and identified the portion of town that would be subject to flooding and it's, it's a very realistic uh, problem and it's a growing challenge for our communities. And so they have to work with our federal agencies and uh, state agencies to ensure that they have the proper mechanisms in place to uh, do this transition. Uh, this may require uh, examining our local and our state laws to ensure that they're up to date with uh, climate challenges and resiliency. Uh, for financial assistance, we may have to look at a federal government to assist us because uh, these programs can be very expensive. And uh, the last thing we need to do is have individual homeowners uh, take it on their own and provide mitigation problems that channel the water to the neighbor to the north or the south or east or west. And uh, that's not really a solution. So the solution has to be a holistic approach where we do it by communities and uh, ensure that our residents are safe. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move to another question now. Uh, Senator Sevney, you'll be the first to respond after I, after I read the question. Given the possibility that Roe v. Wade could be overturned by the Supreme Court, do you favor passing the Equality in Abortion Coverage Act? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, I'm. Uh... I'm a strong supporter of pro-choice and uh, I think government should stay out of the way uh, and allow people to make their own choices unfettered and just uh, go about their own business uh, without any interference and with as much support as, uh, 
as uh, as we can provide. It's a you know it's obviously a very difficult, very personal choice. It's between a woman and her family and her doctor, and uh, it's nobody else's business. Thank you, Representative Donovan. Am I muted? Let's see. Yep. Okay. So uh, this is a question of equity. And the question is, should all Rhode Island families have access to the health services they need? You know, on one hand, the General Assembly codified the right to an abortion by passing the Reproductive Privacy Act in 2019. But on the other hand, and we deny access to that same right to our own state employees and those that use Medicaid. I don't think that the state of Rhode Island should be following the lead of some states that legislate forced pregnancy and birth without regard for a woman's health or the financial stability of her family. No one knows that. No one knows the answers to that except that family, that woman, and that doctor. I think it's time to change the law. So yes, I support um, the legislation. Thank you, Representative McGaw. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I've actually signed on as a co-sponsor of this legislation. Uh, even before I was elected, I was working really hard with advocates advocates to pass the Reproductive Privacy Act. I spent down, some time down in Washington in front of the Supreme Court advocating for for um, improved access uh, nationwide. Uh, I, I think this, this is a form of healthcare and, and we can't discriminate based upon where your income from. You know, we, we've already decided that this is the law and that it's legal in Rhode Island. And so regardless of, of you know, where your money is coming from, where you work, uh, where you live, you should have access to healthcare. We can't discriminate uh, from one person to the other. And uh, I, I just really think that these decisions have to be made. These are healthcare decisions and they have to be made between a doctor and a patient. And so um, in light of the fact that we've already made this the law in Rhode Island and in light of the fact that we shouldn't be discriminating from uh, one patient to another, uh, I signed on as a sponsor to this legislation and I'll be happy to vote for it if we can get it to come to the floor for a vote. Thank you, Senator Felix. Well, as everyone has stated in 2019, the General Assembly uh, passed the Reproductive uh, Privacy Act and it became law and it codified the uh, privacy rights guaranteed by uh, Roe and Wade. Uh, this particular equity bill is separate from Roe and Wade and that it required a uh, thorough vetting by the Health and Human Service Committee uh, to view the bill and make a recommendation to the full committee. Uh, abortion is allowed, I believe, under certain circumstances. And so those circumstances would be incest or uh, uh, rape, or uh, if the fetus was being in, or the mother was being endangered, uh, they could have an abortion, but this would expand it into the Roe versus Wade language. Uh, it was not included in the uh, governor's budget as a budget article. So it would have to be a budget article or a separate bill and let the committee do their process and see what they bring to the floor. Representative Corcoran. Yes, I would support it if it comes to the floor. Um, I echo all the comments that my colleagues have made. It's, uh, this is a basic healthcare right and it shouldn't, we should be fair across the board. It's legal in Rhode Island. And um, I think we, we can't discriminate against one class of people uh, depending on where their healthcare is coming from. It's, a, it's part of healthcare and it should be determined by a woman and her doctor. So yes, I support the bill. Thank you. Moving on to, to a new question now, Representative uh, Donovan, you will be the first to answer. Uh, after I read it. Newport County and its districts are diverse. The needs and issues for Newport or Middletown can be vastly different from those in Portsmouth, Tiverton, or Little Compton. Considering this diversity, what do you consider the single most important issue that you can deal with as a member of the Rhode Island legislature? Well, 
as legislators, I think we should be making a concerted effort to adequately fund or increase funding for state aid to education. It's by far the biggest burden for our communities and we should be doing everything we can to lobby during that budget, um, the budget negotiations for increased funding for state aid. You know, our cities and towns, as everyone knows, are so reliant on property taxes and, and it's so hard to keep up with the growing funding needs in education. So I think it's, it's just imperative that we really push for more funding for education um, and for, this, for our cities and towns. Thank you. Thanks. Representative McGaugh. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. We are a very, we're, we're a diverse community, but we also have a lot of things in common. We share a lot of the same, same issues and concerns. And so I think uh, the fact that we all work so collaboratively together is a real bonus for us. Uh, for me, one of the things that I'm really focused on this year is making sure that people, that we, everyone in the state of Rhode Island has the tools we need to get us past this pandemic, whether it is access to vaccination, whether we are taking every necessary precaution to, um, such as masking to prevent transmission of disease, to make sure that testing is available. Uh, I, I want to, I really want to get us past this pandemic. I think it's so important from a health, a public health perspective, and also from an economic perspective. And so that's one of the things that I'm really advocating for this year. And I think it's going to make, it's going to be just so important to all of our communities across the East Bay. So that's a big priority for me. Um, and the other thing that I'm really focused on are climate issues and, uh, you know, because I, 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 again, we are all shoreline communities and greatly impacted by the changes that we're going to make environmentally. And so uh, that's another thing that I think we can focus on that will have significant impact on people across the East Bay. Thank you, Senator Felak. It's an interesting question for me because I represent one of those five towns that you uh, talked about, but I can reference back to the East Bay with Barrington and Warren uh, being different. And I believe that uh, Representative Dunn hit the nail on the head when she said educational funding, because that, that's the key. Uh, when we were able as a legislature to provide 30,000, 30 million, uh, dollars a year into education. Uh, it's, it's a goal that we got to continue. Uh, getting back to uh, the redistricting committee that I was on, uh, the median for the Senate and the House were like 28,800 and 14,600. And I tried to ensure that the East Bay representation was greater and to ensure that our representation was below that median. And I was able to accomplish that so that we could get more representation in terms uh, at the state outs to provide this uh, educational funding. Because uh, as you know, it's an, an important thing for communities. It's all about property taxes and how can we help and establish our, our individual communities. And that's by ensuring that we have more funding for education. Thank you. Representative Cortfriend. Thank you. Um, while I have personally been working on environmental issues, which I think are very important for the entire state, um, I'll uh, chime in uh, regarding education because for the East Bay, our, our Newport County um, cities and towns, I think increasing the state share, um, I would love to see that happen. Um, Unfortunately, I don't sit on finance, so I will have to rely on my our senators here that do um, to advocate on behalf of for Newport County and see that state share increase. Because what we've observed um, during the pandemic is a decline in enrollment. And there seems to be, um, I was talking to uh, Tim Ryan from the S Superintendents Association, and they're of the belief that we may not see these numbers rebound back into the students come back into the school department that this some of this decline may be permanent. So looking at that funding formula very carefully um, is is important. And um, I uh, was glad to see the Senate take that up a couple of years ago and have a study commission and I am advocating that we do that in the House in the near in the near term. Thank you, Senator Seveny. 
Well, thanks. Um, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the premise of the question. I think we are defined more by our similarities than any differences. Uh, and all the issues that, that have been mentioned um, cut across all our, all our communities, and certainly within the, the, the East Bay and uh, Newport County region. Um, we have issues with housing. We have issues with education. We certainly have the pandemic issues and getting people uh, vaccinated and all that. I wish we had a vaccination for the mental health and substance abuse issues that uh, were a problem well before the pandemic ever started and have only been uh, uh, exacerbated since. Um, that happens to be my particular hot button is, is, uh, is, is mental health and, and uh, substance abuse prevention, uh, specifically amongst our school age kids. Uh, middle school, high school, uh, you know, the state uh, contributes almost nothing in local dollars to help with the substance abuse problems. And what we do is re redistribute the, uh, the monies that come from the feds. Uh, and I think that needs to be changed. And we've been working on legislation for years to try to get that done. And we'll continue to work on it because through this pandemic, what we've seen it's, it's shown a bright light on just how bad this problem is. And uh, I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you. And thank you all for being respectful of the time. I only uh, had a couple of you go over by a few seconds. So thank you all. So we're going to move to closing statements. Senator Seventy, you're going to start us off. We're going to go back in reverse order of the opening statements. Um, 90 seconds each. Well, same thing with the yellow and red cards. And uh, feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, I'd just like to say again, thank you to the, uh, the League of Women Voters, certainly to the East Bay uh, News Organization for sponsoring this. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll repeat what I said earlier. It's, uh, it's incredibly important, you know, for us to have access to the people who may be voting for us uh, uh, in, in the fall and tell them how we feel about uh, the key issues. And I thought the questions were, were great. Uh, it's, uh, you know, this is my third term as well. Uh, I'm into my sixth year doing this in the Senate and it's been just an incredible honor. And uh, I've enjoyed every moment of my service and, uh, and uh, I hope I can continue to serve effectively. So, and thanks for having me. Thank you. Representative Cortfriend. Thank you. Um, thank you for hosting this. Um, I think these events are very important to give us a chance to communicate more broadly with our constituents. And I would just like to um, tell my constituents that they can reach me at, at any time. I try to be as accessible as possible. You can email me, you can call me, and I will try to respond as uh, promptly as possible. I'm honored to serve, and um, I have enjoyed all my time in the House and look forward to running for re-election this coming fall. And, um, and I uh, enjoy serving with uh, my esteemed colleagues here on the panel tonight. So thank you very much to the League and to the East Bay newspapers for hosting us tonight. Thank you. Senator Felix. Well, I guess I'm running for re-election. I don't know. Uh, I consider myself to be a, a community servant uh, who represents all the people of my district and the uh, the towns themselves. And uh, I'm honored to be with a uh, esteemed group of colleagues in the Senate and the House. Uh, too often, we don't get uh, credit for all the work that we do. Uh, people don't realize that it's not only just going to the meetings, uh, it ends up going to uh, public events, whether it be the Boy Scout events or Little League events and providing grants for our constituents and uh, addressing those constituent needs uh, through emails and phone calls and being able to uh, <clears throat> call up the proper people in state government to ensure our constituents' uh, needs are, are met. Uh, this session, I'll be focusing obviously on the budget as they had in the past. It's a $12.8 billion budget, but 4.8 of that budget is what I really focus in on. And, and that part of the budget is the uh, general operation budget. Uh, we have probably $5 billion uh, of, of the budget that's uh, 
federal funds that we utilize. I'll be focusing in on the opera funds and then also uh, bills that are before my committee on special legislation and veterans affairs, and then my own set of uh, bills. And I ask people to uh, look up my bills you know, for the last couple of years and see how successful I've been in passing legislation and also uh, making budget amendments uh, to the budget. So thank you. Thank you. Representative McGaw. Like my colleagues, I, I really want to thank you for, for hosting this. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity just to talk with some of the people of Newport County and, and talk a little bit about the issues. I think it's really important that uh, our electorate is has, has an access to the information about what their elected officials are working on. I know I hosted a forum very similar to this uh, back before I was elected because I recognize just, just how important that is. Um, I'm excited to be working with my colleagues and uh, so closely on so many issues. And I feel like we've already, you know, even though I've only been there for a year, I feel like I've already been able to have some impact uh, working on mental and behavioral health issues, suicide prevention, education, uh, access to health care, climate initiatives. I feel like uh, we had a really good last year last year, and I'm really excited about what we can accomplish this year. Uh, like Representative Cortvrin, I just want to reiterate that if any of my constituents have any questions or, or concerns, please reach out to me via email or phone call. I'm happy to talk with any of them. Um, and, and lastly, I just want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters and to uh, East Bay Media Group and our local newspapers, because I think you're, you're playing such an important role in, in keeping the public informed about the issues. So thank you. Thank you. And Representative Donovan. Here we go. Sorry, I can't get the mute button fast enough. So like everyone else, I am so grateful to, you know, for this opportunity um, and this forum. So thanks to the League and to the East Bay newspapers. I hope we can do this more often and in our other communities as well. Um, I, I am just so I am just so happy to have the group of legislators in the East Bay that we have so much in common and we're so hyper-focused on the issues that we do have in common and, and the ones that are important to our um, constituents. Last year, I, you know, I had some successes with um, my pay equity bill, a plastics reduction bill, and in some insurance privacy bills. And this, I just wanted to tell you a little bit what I'm working on this year. I'm working on a just a bill called Just Transitions to Clean Energy, which would set up and strengthen the support processes for dis displaced fossil fuel workers in the transition to a carbon-free economy. Um, this bill would touch many state agencies, including the DLT or Department of Labor and Training, apprenticeship programs, as well as um, education opportunities. Another bill is called Toxic Free Kids, which would require disclosure of toxic chemicals in children's products and would direct the Department of Environmental Management um, to identify um, those products and um, their removal, their eventual removal. Um, and another one is feminine hygiene companies to be able to donate their products to food banks and food and shelters and food pantries. And they're not allowed to do that right now because of the liability issues. So I'm working on that um, as we speak. So again, thank you. And thank you to my colleagues for being here. And I hope, like I said, I hope we can do this again really soon. All right, thank you. So uh, that concludes tonight's forum or this morning's forum, whenever you choose to view this. Um, thank you to all the panelists for taking part, all the members of our General Assembly. And, and I, um, I said to them before beginning that I was going to call them all by the first names. And then when I got going, I called them all by the formal names because I actually think it's probably more deserving since we are talking to elected leaders and members of the General Assembly. So I found myself giving you the respect you deserve. So thank you all for your service. Thank you all for taking part tonight. Um, I appreciate it. And yes, this was a good forum. And I think there will be more. Look for future forums where we hold them all accountable to what they said tonight. See if they accomplished what they said they would, or at least tried to accomplish what they said they would. And then uh, if they all run for office, we can have some forums where uh, where, where they um, 
get to talk with their opponents and have lively dialogue. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Thanks to the League of Women Voters, Newport County chapter for uh, putting it together. They do 98% uh, of the work and I just show up uh, right now and get all the attention, but they, they do all the work and deserve all the credit for this. Um, thank you all and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Take care and have a great evening. Bye. Thank you.